Welcome to Laura Haywood Interviews. I'm Laura Haywood, and I wanted to take an opportunity to play an interview for you that uh, that I'm really proud of. The interview is with Daryl Roth. She is one of the most incredible and prolific producers in Broadway history and uh, really has a unique take on how to use the theater to uh, to inspire progress, both uh, on stage but especially off stage. I was honored a few weeks ago to appear at the fall conference for the National Alliance for Musical Theater. Uh, they have members all over the country who are uh, dedicated to bringing theater to their communities, musical theater specifically, from tiny little regional theaters to huge touring theaters. The goal is to uh, to be a catalyst for nurturing musical theater development, production, innovation, and collaboration. And every year in the fall, uh, NAMT, as they're called, that's N-A-M-T for the National Alliance for Musical Theater, they get together uh, to talk about what's going on in their individual theaters and in their industry. And there's always a keynote presentation. In past years, it's been a speech. But uh, last year, as a matter of fact, uh, the playwright David Henry Huang was asked to give the speech, and he said he'd rather do a Q&A, an interview, than a speech. And uh, he suggested me as the person to come and do that interview with him. It went so well that this year, when Daryl Roth was announced as the keynote speaker, uh, she said she'd rather sit down with me uh, than do this, didn't do a traditional speech, too. And I had always wanted to interview her, so it was a great honor. Uh, today, I'm dipping back into the archives to a never-before-heard interview with Daryl Roth. Uh, it was only heard by the people in that room. So I'm really excited for you to hear it. Uh, we're going to do it uh right now. Uh, but first, I just want to explain, I reference at the very beginning um, that each of the theaters had gone around and said the thing that they were most proud of that year. And for some people, it was fundraising. For some, uh, for some organizations, it was a specific uh, production that they had pulled off. For some, it was a new hire or an anniversary. Um, each had 20 seconds. And so you'll hear me reference those. I wish they were part of the recording. Sadly, they're not. But uh, I am very proud to uh, to have been there, to have heard what's going on in the state of American musical theater. And I want to remind you, no matter where you are in the country, in the world, there is someone making musical theater, and uh, you just need to go and find it and support it. Broadway isn't everything, and not everything great makes it to Broadway. So, uh, so please support your local musical theater. And without further delay, here is my conversation with Daryl Ross. Thank you so much for having us. Wow, listening to those 20-second uh, stories of glory, as, as they seem to me, was so inspiring. Um, I think that it's easy for us in New York City to sometimes forget how much theater is going on around the world, and wow, what a group we're surrounded by. So it's an honor to be here. And I know that one thing all the rest of us have in common is that we are inspired by the work of Daryl Roth. So what an honor to have you here to talk about this show. Nice. Warm welcome. Thanks. So, uh, so the NAMS conference focuses on the past, present, and and future of the American musical theater. And one thing that I love about you, Daryl, is that you've always seemed to have this uncanny ability to mix all three. You're always in the present. You always seem to have your finger on the pulse. But you tell historical stories. You do revivals. I'm particularly excited about How I Learned to Drive, finally making its Broadway debut. How many years after the play made it? 22. This was, a, this was the play that changed my life when I discovered it in high school, and it's finally coming to Broadway. So you're dipping into the past to bring it to the future. Um, Indecent was a story of the past, um, brought into the future in a, in a really modern way. Um, and you're all, you've also dipped into the future but like, for example, when you saw the film Kinky Boots and said, that's a story that needs to be told on Broadway. Has that been a conscious choice for you, or has it just kind of developed that way over the course of your career? That's really an interesting thing for me to think about, actually. I'll first say that going into the past for me is interesting in a maybe surprising way to you, but... Many years ago, I produced How I Learned to Drive, and I always thought that it was such an important play, but I also felt it might have been a bit before its time. It did well off-Broadway, and I was very proud of it. However, events being what they are, and women speaking up about incidents, assaults, and harassments, 
which is so much in the news now, made me feel that this was the time to bring back how I learned to drive in a way that it would be perhaps more powerful, more potent. And my thought was, many women are speaking up now about things that happened 20 years ago. And I thought how perfect it would be if we could get Mary Louise Parker and David Morse, the original cast, to come back and present this play, um, which is happily what we did. Uh, Manhattan Theatre Club is, is housing us and presenting it with us. And I think that going into the past when it makes sense is very valuable because we learn from the past as we move, as we move forward. So that's kind of it. And about indecent, which I was very happy to hear someone had recently produced it. I'm so proud of that play, and I think that it has a message about art and how much it means to all of us, particularly those of you in this room, and the power of theater to last through the ages, through horrific times, and to bring the joy. So I'm thrilled about that, whoever that was. I want to just say thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing Indecent. Um, and the future for me, now that I'm getting older, it's all about, I'm mean, really feeling older as I'm reviving my own plays. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel it, but my sister once gave me the greatest gift. It's a little pillow and it says, age is just a number and mine's unlisted. So I'm gonna live with that. <laughs> but for the future, I think about my daughter and my granddaughters and I've tried to choose projects uh, that really can inspire them and give them strength and give them confidence and have them understand that uh, being a young woman in today's world has so many opportunities and, and so many, you know, scary things too, but I think theater is a way for us to offer those opportunities, those thoughts, those hopes, those dreams in a safe way. So I think my future now, I guess, I don't mean to ramble on, but my we future... have an hour, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> the two new musicals I'm working on, which were mentioned, actually have a very youthful approach and have young people in them. And actually, I hope, will inspire young people to kind of live and write their own stories. So that's what I'm looking for right now. I'm looking for ways to, to enlighten people and to, to give hope in a dreary world. I feel it's our job as theater producers to kind of look around and see what's going on and how can we interpret that? How can we make meaning out of what's happening? And not to be a downer about it, but I think there are ways that we can uh, project what's happening in ways that help people understand other people and help us open our minds to other people. That's always been an important part of my choosing what I like to do and what I feel I can represent and facilitate happening, which kind of is what a producer does. I would like to be able to do the kind of plays and musicals that help people understand others and, um, and understand that we actually all are outsiders in one way or another. And I think to celebrate that and to understand that is something remarkable and I think something that, that theater was meant to do. Hope and inspiration have certainly been a through line I've seen in every work of yours that I've explored, whether I've, I've seen a lot of them on stage, um, but there have been so many. I would, I, other than you and perhaps your immediate family, I wonder if anybody has ever managed to see the entire Daryl Roth catalog, uh, but that sounds like a bucket list to me. Um, but, but hope and inspiration really are the through line, and it's amazing that you're, you've been able to find works like that are as, as sort of heartbreaking and, and feel so dark like like the normal heart or like wit um, that deal with such tragedy and then such such light fun fair like kinky boots which of course has its its own undercurrent of, of trauma and difficulty but is a it's a jazz hands jerry mitchell musical you know um and i think that it's i find it remarkable and inspiring that you that you have a there is a kind of a Daryl Roth show, but they, but it's also just such a diverse catalog. Um, you seem to have, from the very beginning, coming into producing um, as, as a second career after getting your start in interior design, you have really seemed to have a firm feeling in your gut about what is a right, the right show for you. 
Can you talk about that gut instinct, that gut feeling you've had, and how that has been your primary motivator as opposed to, say, the bottom line? Uh, yes, well, thank you. I don't want you to think I don't think about the bottom line. <laughs> I said primary motivator, not only motivator. I think about it every night when I'm not sleeping because it's not doing too well. Uh, but the answer to your question is that I look for things that mean something to me personally. And then I explore, will that mean something to others? And I, I think that I've had a bit of a woven tapestry, and the threads all seem to relate to my Jewish heritage, issues of gender. As you probably know, my son Jordan is gay and has inspired me to look for theater pieces that can help other young people be true to themselves. Kinky Boots was a big part of that. I mean, the father-son relationship in Kinky Boots, when I saw the movie, was the seed of what drew me to it. Not the glitter and glam that it became, though I love every last <laughs> moment of it and every last piece of glitter and glam, but the story was the father-son story, and that was very personal to me and my family. And in the case of uh, plays that deal with uh, women's stories, you know, I feel that as a female producer, it would be my responsibility, if not my obligation, to bring those stories to the stage and to package them with other women. So I've tried very hard to bring in women producers, women designers, um, you know, directors, and try to tell the stories in a very organic and honest way. And that just, my instinct tells me that's the right thing that I was meant to do. It may not be right for everyone. Everyone has their own interest and their own guidelines of, of what helps you decide what, what you want to do and what you want your legacy to be. And in my case, I think it just was very personal. It was just really personal. I mean, I came to this industry with zero training. Let me just tell you that. My, my path was not into theater other than loving theater more than anything. When I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, when my parents allowed me to come on the bus by myself, I would go right to a theater and I would sit by myself and I was the happiest person in the whole wide world. And when I would read, I would read a play, not a book. People thought I was really odd that way, and, and I was. But it was fun because I knew that I was going into these worlds and I, I found great, I don't know, great solace and happiness, I would say. So it's gut. It's all gut. I always say to young people, you must trust your instincts. You must trust what you feel. People will all do different things, but we all come from different places. And if you can be true to what's interesting to you and assume that other people will be interested in that as well, I think that's a safe guideline. I feel that's what we have. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I try to live my life by the same standards, and I think you know, it's, it's one thing to step out into the world as a human being, as an individual, and make choices for our own lives that way. It's another when you have an entire company of people who are depending on you. And uh, everyone I've talked to who knows you and has worked with you describes you with the same adjectives. The number one word used to describe you is grace. And I think what a beautiful, what a beautiful word for, for, especially for a leader in a cutthroat industry. Um, you, you have, you have, you are, the New York Times calls you one of the most influential people in theater, and there, there's no doubt, I think, that that is the case. Um, and yet you, you have an approachable quality and a, a warmth about you that I think is very rare. Has that been something that you've cultivated carefully, or is that just the nature of how you were born? I hope it's a little of both. <laughs> I hope it's a little of both. I mean, I come from a very uh, warm and loving family, and, and I was shown, I was shown how to how to be with people and how to accept people and their differences. I come from a very liberal thinking family, and I guess you know, growing up as I did in New Jersey, I was. Um, a bit of an outsider, I will admit. I was the only Jewish person in my school for many years until my sister four years behind me came along. And while I felt, you know, kind of comfortable in every way, you're still a bit of an outsider when you are the only anything. And I think that that taught me to be very accepting of other people. And so the way I hope 
the way I hope I produce is by accepting everyone and, and giving the respect and the dignity that everyone that is working in what I call my theater family because every production is a different family and every company becomes, becomes that unit. And I hope that I have been able to act with grace and make people feel their value. I think that's really important to me. Well, I can tell you from personal experience that you have managed to do that not just with your immediate uh, theatrical family, meaning the people who are in some level or another on your payroll, but your productions always seem to take the extra step to include the audience as collaborators instead of as customers. And this is something that I advocate very strongly for, that if you treat an audience member like a dollar sign, you won't have the same connection with them as you will if you treat them as your collaborate as your collaborators. I like to say theater is uh, theater without an audience is a rehearsal. And you've you've worked into you've worked into many of your recent productions talkbacks um, with Gloria, a life. There was an entire second act. It was called the second act that was a talking circle, which is something I know that Gloria herself inspired. Um, you've gone to great lengths to bring uh, school audiences in to create dialogue. Um, and this also seems very much like a symbol of, of grace, of the giving back, the, the generosity that goes in both directions. Um, perhaps uh, in relation to Gloria, but not necessarily only in relation to Gloria, can you talk about the importance of the conversation between the audience and the theater creators? Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I feel very strongly about that. The first time um, I initiated a talk back in my career was with the play Wit, Margaret Edson's play Wit, which, if you remember, was about a woman dying of ovarian cancer. And in the beginning, it starred Kathy Chalfant, who was brilliant and went on to star Judith Light in her first return to Broadway, or off-Broadway in real fact, but her first return to theater. That was a play that required conversation. At the end of the play, everyone was locked in their seats. They had just seen something remarkable, and it was hard to process, and it was something that I felt people needed to talk to one another about. And so we started Talk Back Tuesdays. And this is a long time ago. Now Talk Backs, thank goodness, I think, are part of every, you know, everybody's theater experience. We found that bringing in caregivers and bringing in nurses and doctors to be able to talk to the audience after the play had ended was so cathartic for people that it just became a thing. And everyone would now sign up for Tuesdays, which was a bit of a problem because, you know, I needed to fill the house on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But the Tuesday talkbacks became very special. And it, it showed us all that there's an opportunity to take what you see on stage and bring it home with you. And to this day, I think about that with everything that I do. I want people to leave the theater and take something home in their hearts or their minds. Activate. After you've seen something, go do something that you've just learned about. When we did The Normal Heart, the talkbacks were extraordinary. And more people wrote to me and told me that they decided to go volunteer for God's Love We Deliver or volunteer for, you know, any organization that they have even heard about or not only just learned about. And I felt that that's the note of success. When you can leave the theater and you feel that you can now do something as a person in this world, you have your <coughs> eyes open and you can go do something. And talking about the theater when it's fresh in your mind, I think gives you that enthusiasm and gives you that, that right to go out and say, I can do something. I can do something. And I thought that when we did it with Gloria, which was very specific, um, if any of you saw Gloria, it was set up in the round. And that was Gloria's idea, as you mentioned, because she has taken it from the Native American culture where, where people are um, not ranked. People are not ranked. Everyone is equal. So we set the, the uh, stage in a circle. And the talk back after it was amazing. It was actually act two. It was the whole part of the show. And the cast participated. Gloria participated on many nights. And my idea about that was to bring in young people that didn't know much about Gloria Steinem or the feminist movement. They didn't know who these women were, whose shoulders they stand on now. And it was such an educational process, in addition to being 
very entertaining. I don't mean to say it was spinachy. People just really learned a lot, and they thanked us for it, which I guess is all you can hope for. Right? I was one of those people on, a, on an, a, an occasion when Gloria was there, and I raised my hand to talk in that talking circle, and I could barely get a word out. I thought I knew about Gloria Steinem. You know, I studied her. I, I knew about Miz, and you know, I, and I, I was shocked at how much I learned from that and how inspired I was uh, uh, by that. By that. It's project. a very personal story, and it, it took her a while to come around to really uh, including things in the play. We, I commissioned Emily Mann to write, so it was like an open book. It was a wide open canvas, and what Gloria and Emily talked about, with the help of Diane Paulus, who quite brilliantly directed it. Because there's so much information about a person's life, you can imagine, and such a vivid and exciting life. And in the beginning, it was pretty much what you could read in a book. And the more they worked on it, the more we talked about it, just the more personal it became. And I think that's what moved people and, and you know, and made it feel like something really, really special. So that's, that's it. Yeah. Well, theater is the place where the artist and the consumer can we really literally breathe the same air. And I think that's what makes it so magical. That doesn't happen with movies and it doesn't happen with books, except for in a project you're working on right now called Between the Lines, where uh, the book and the, and the reader actually do talk back and forth. To nice each other. I know. Um, tell us about Between the Lines. If we're talking about the future of theater for Daryl Roth, I think that Between the Lines is, uh, is a place we need to go. I'm happy to talk about it. I really am excited about this. It's, it's uh, based on a book by Jodi Pico, who many of you may know. She's a very popular uh, writer, and she wrote this book with her daughter, Sammy Van Leer, some years ago. And she came to me because she said, I've written many, many books. This is the one I think could be a musical. So I was flattered that she knocked on my door, and I said, well, let's talk about it. And I read the book, and at that moment, to refer to what I mentioned earlier, I was looking for something that would be very empowering for young women, and this book is that, to a T. So we put together a team of people who um, create this musical, two very talented uh, writer, composer, uh, lyricist named Alyssa Samsell and Kate Anderson, who I hope you'll be hearing a lot about, and they wrote wonderful, wonderful songs, and Jody, along with Tim McDonald, adapted the book from from the book Between the Lines. It's the story of a young girl in high school who's very much of an outsider. And she falls in love with books and reading as her solace, as her safe place. And she spends a lot of time in the library with this wonderful character, the librarian, um, because that's where she feels safe. And little by little, she comes upon these books that are much too young for her to be reading, fables, really. And she falls in love with one of the fables and the prince, particularly in the fable. And the prince starts talking to her. And his thing is he wants to get out of the book and be in the real world and experience things and get me out of this book. I'm trapped. And she only wants to jump into the book and live in a world where everything has a happy ending. So for me, the story is basically about young people finding where they belong. And it opens up so many wonderful opportunities for young people to relate to the various characters who are cross-generational. We have their, um, Delilah has a mom and the librarian and there's a school psychologist. And the beauty of it is that the, uh, the piece as we've constructed it takes place in two worlds, as you would imagine, the real world and the book world. And all the characters are in both. So Delilah's mother is the queen in the other world. And anyway, it's kind of glorious. Other than saying that you can come see it in April at Second Stage, which I'd love for you all to, we're there for 17 weeks. Um, other than that, what I think is special about it is that we have already, just since announcing it, gotten letters from young people who have said, will, will Jody be there? Will her daughter be there? They feel so connected. So I immediately called Jody and said, you need to be here. <laughs> And there are nine nights that they'll come and talk to people, back to the talk back idea, where people just want to come in and hear more and get more involved and really jump into the, into the book in a way. The end of the story is wonderful in between the lines. She writes her own story, Delilah writes her own story, and the other, I think, takeaway from this particular musical is that you don't have to live the story you're born into. You can write your own story. And for me, that's a very empowering piece of information to send out 
not only to young people, to old people. I mean, I started my career in my 40s, which, you know, everyone said, really? Um, do you know anything about theater? And I would say, no, but I think I can learn. I know I love theater, and I know that I'm a quick study. I'll work hard. I'll be tenacious. And so 30 years later, that's what I'm still doing because I love it so much. But I, I feel that we have to inspire people by what we put out in the world. And I think Between the Lines is one of those empowering stories, so um, blah, blah, blah. Did your, did your launch into this new career come because you saw a piece of art that felt like it was speaking directly to you, instructing you that you had that power? Didn't, uh, the, the story that I've heard is that um, is that you were working on you working on the board of what became the city oh, yeah, setting on yeah. center right. city center encores, and you were invited to a reading of some songs that were about that's right changing. I, uh, you, I, I feel like the story would be, would be better if you share it than if I do. <laughs> <laughs> I need to remind you. Were there specific songs? It was, that, totally, it was totally that. I'll tell you the whole story. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> I was on, one of the things I wanted to do when I first started was to immerse myself in any way that I could, in any way that anybody would be willing to open their door to me. And I, I had a friend who was on the board of uh, City Center at the time, and he invited me to become involved and just sit around and see what I could pick up. And I eventually went on the board of City Center, and the position that they thought I'd be good at was a committee that was being formed to bring back old musicals. We now know it as encores, but that many years ago, there was a committee headed by Richard Malby Jr., and I was on that committee. And we became friends. I think he saw in me, you know, just this eager beaver, and he was happy to share whatever musical theater knowledge I could absorb, and I wanted it all. And we talked, and we worked on this committee, and it was really a good experience for me. And one day, Richard said, you know, David Shire, my partner and I have written a couple of songs. They're going to be producing it down, uh, presenting it down at 88, which, as you may know, was a terrific piano bar club downtown, which sadly went away. And I always used to love to tell people it was called 88 for the 88 piano keys, which a lot of people didn't know, so I like that. Anyway, I went that night, and I sat there, and it was like someone pierced my heart with an arrow. It really is true. There were songs about life changes, about doors opening and going through new doors, open doors to try something new. It was about role reversals, children taking care of their parents. It was about everything. It was about love stories gone away, love stories with happy endings. It was everything in life. It was, at that time, a musical review. I said to Richard, and I, I've been quoted as saying, I don't know who was speaking from my voice, because where I would get the confidence to even say this is unknown to me to this day. I said, Richard, I think this would be a great little musical. Can I produce it? And I said, I think I can do something with this. And he said, sure. Nobody else had knocked on the door, so what was the difference? And it became Closer Than Ever, which was the first thing that I ever produced in 1988. We took it to Williamstown that summer, and I had high hopes, but you know, you never know. And people really liked it. And so we moved it to the Cherry Lane Theater, and it ran for nine months. And I like to say that because it was the birth of a baby, and it was nine months that it ran to the day. I learned a big lesson, which I'll share with everybody. I had been put together with a general manager who was very knowledgeable, and when we opened, the reviews were mixed. I read them all as fabulous, but they were mixed. <laughs> Don't think we could all do that. <laughs> Now we read what we want to read. And he said, look, I, I don't think this is going to make it. And I think you should, you know, wisely look at the money that you have in the bank and see if you want to lose it and keep going or take your, you know, make this a decision to close. I said to this person, you must be kidding. I did not do this to close it. I did this to make it run. So I went home and I talked to my husband, who's really good businessman, and I said, look, I don't know what to do. Clearly, I'm on my learning curve. This man who's had a lot of experience and said I really should close the show. It's not going to make it. It's going to lose its money. So my husband, in his wisdom, said, well, what do you feel you should do? I said, I'm going to give it a go, and, you know, let's just see what happens. 
So I did. And I saw in the back of the theater every night when I stood there, people loving it and walking out in tears or, or you know, filled with joy, whatever emotion they left the theater with. And I said, this can work. This can work. I know it can. So I moved on to another general manager. And I, <laughs> and I said to myself, if I'm going to try to do this, I have to be true to myself and I have to believe in what I'm going to do. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but let's at least give it a good try. So the good try lasted nine months, but the better try that I'm so happy to say is that it's done all over the country. Songs are sung at auditions more than any other musical, I'm told, because they're story songs, and they, an actor can really, um, you know, not only sing these songs that Richard and David wrote, but they can, they can become these characters, and they can show a lot about themselves. So they, they serve as wonderful audition songs. Anyway, closer than ever, we had a 25th anniversary, and we're still going, and anyway, that's the story. I'm glad I remembered it. <laughs> I'm glad too. So that was the beginning of your producing career. That was and the first. The, you know, I've known probably hundreds of people who have the title producer over the course of my life. I've, I myself have been a radio producer, I've worked in TV production, um, and I certainly know a lot of theater producers, and I don't know any two people who describe their job the same way. Okay. And it sounds to me like you have had, under the same title of producer, many different uh, courses of action, whether you are uh, commissioning a project like Gloria, whether you're seeing a film at Sundance like Kinky Boots and ushering it into a stage and uh, into the stage and bringing on the creative team, whether you are, um, you know, uh, looking at a revival of something. What is, what does the word producer mean to you and how do you know which of those types of producers to be on any given project? It's a good question, and people often ask, what is a producer, and what does a producer do? Um, I think it's a multifaceted answer, which I'll try to do directly. Um, the first thing I, I say when people say, what does a producer do? I say, a producer is a facilitator of other people's dreams. And I love that title, because it feels to me like a job I want. So it's partly that. I think a producer is the first person to believe in something, and the last person to give up. I also like saying that. Oh my gosh, put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I believe that. I think that a producer can do different things on different productions. I myself have been a lead producer and, and as you say, commissioned things and birthed things. And I've also joined in with other producers when they're doing a project that I'm excited about and that I feel, you know, really wants to have have a life and maybe I'm in a position to help them financially, I'm more than happy to do that as well. So then I would be a co-producer. Um, I have a big issue with that because I think if you're not the lead producer, then you are a co-producer and be proud of that, you know. I don't like it when people say I am the producer when you see on the, you know, the title page you might be 40 producers. Um, you know, you are one of the producers or you are the co-producer. I'm very, I'm very picky about that. But that's okay. I mean, everybody is needed, so I don't want to say anything that is off-putting. But I think it's good to be honest about what our roles are. And I've often been co-producer in other people's productions um, very happily. Also, I've moved things from other theaters. Uh, sometimes that's a way to produce, where you don't originate it, but you see it, you fall in love, and you want to give it the extended life. That's a way to be a producer. Uh, my favorite way to be a producer is to find a project and originate it. But that can't happen all the time. And I like to keep my finger in the pie, so to speak. And I know that there are a lot of people that, you know, I don't mean to be boastful about this, but there are a lot of young producers that I know if I could add my name to their project, it might give it a little bit of a, maybe a cachet. I mean, I don't want to be anything less than humble about this. But I've helped people in that way, and I feel good about that. Because sometimes you just need somebody that feels like they have more experience so that they can go out and raise more money based on that. So I'm happy to do that from time to time. Um, but that's what I think a producer does. A producer does everything. A producer is the umbrella under which everything else can come to life. I mean, right now I'm working on a play that's closed, a beautiful one-woman show called Accidentally Brave. Oh, like one of my favorites. Song. One of the most moving pieces of theater I've ever seen. Yeah. It was a very powerful one-person play based on a true story 
that the woman, Maddie Corman, who wrote the play, lived the situation that she wrote the play about and performed it. It was glorious. And I will say, while we didn't really want to have talkbacks, no one left the theater after the show. And so the lobby became a talkback every night because people just wanted to hug her and thank her and, and commiserate with their stories and her story. Anyway, it was brilliant. Point I want to make is now that it's closed, it was a limited engagement. My my uh, continued objective as a producer is to have it happen in many, many places because I know it will help a lot of people. Um, and it is coming out on Audible in November, so if you didn't get a chance to see it, you can hear it. One of my favorite things about the way that show came to fruition is that you've told me that one of the reasons it was important to you to produce was that it was going to be helpful for Maddie herself. And that is something I've never heard a producer say, that I'm doing this to help facilitate the growth of the, of the artist in an emotional, in an impersonal way. It seemed like the opposite of a commercial production, and yet it, it still managed to have a commercial run. That is something I don't know a single other person in theater who would do as, as a gift to a person they love. Well, thank you. I did feel strongly about it. I just felt that um, this woman was in a place that she needed to move on. And she had, with encouragement from friends, and myself included, she had written her story. And it wasn't enough for her to just write her story and have it sit on the desk. I felt she, as an actress, would be able to really make a leap forward in her own life if she could perform it. If you don't do what you believe in, and if you don't do it for the right reasons, you know, what's the point? Turned out that it was actually successful. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's always a nice surprise, but you can't go into things with that always as the first check, you know. It just anyway, I, I know it helped her and I know that she's moving on. It was a very traumatic experience that she lived through with her family. We take so much from the artists, you know, we take all of their their talent, we take what they can give and then we try to package it in a way that we can then give it back as a gift to other people. And I guess when you think about things that way as a producer, you can actually, um, you can do good for individuals, you know, you can do things because you choose to do them. And I think in any profession, we all do things because we make choices. You all make the choices of what you want to present in your theater, what you want to develop, what do you want to stand behind. And so choices are what we live by. And I think that sometimes we, I think we have to think about it on a human level. That's all. We just have to make our choices uh, and think about why we're making them. And ultimately, will that be the satisfaction that we want to not only get, but give? What a beautiful lesson for everyone in this room. Um, because I, uh, I haven't been paying attention to the time, can somebody just let me know how we're doing time-wise? I don't want to go over. Okay, about 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes before Q&A? Okay. Okay, great. Well, somebody just cut us off if it's time to cut us off. Um, I want to go back to the idea of humility because I know that you are, you do carry yourself very, like you're, you're, you're a strong, badass woman and nobody doubts it, but you also start stories with, with, I want to be careful not to be too, you know, but I want, I'd like you to revisit another story that I hope that I've got right. Will you talk about the lesson you learned from Lucille Lortel when you want, when you were thinking about putting your name on a theater? As you must know, Lucille Lortel was the queen of Off-Broadway for many years and a wonderful, wonderful woman who championed new writers more than anything. That was her gift, and that's what she did. So, there was a period in time, about 20 years ago, when Off-Broadway was so vibrant that there were not enough Off-Broadway theaters for all of the plays that wanted to find a home. I would like to believe that we're on a cycle and that could actually happen again, but, you know, I sort of believe in things because I want them to happen. But, <laughs> yeah, but when you believe in something because you want it to happen, those things end up happening because well, you help <laughs> usher them into life. I believe in Off-Broadway. I love, I love the intimacy of Off-Broadway. Anyway, I knew Lucille, and she was a big champion of mine because she realized that in the beginning of my career, I was getting a lot of uh, hard knocks. You know, people would say, oh, there's this woman from New Jersey. She doesn't know what she's doing. 
who is she? She didn't come up through the ranks. There was a lot of noise. And I really had to learn to just put my blinders on and believe that I could do what I hoped I could do. So I was trying to push all that noise out of my way. And Lucille asked me to come up to her apartment. I remember she lived at the Sherry Netherland, and she had this beautiful apartment that was like a time capsule. And all the theater things were around. It was kind of glorious. Anyway, she said, I heard, I heard that you're looking for an off-Broadway theater which I was, actually. I was looking for a space to make a new off-Broadway theater because, as I said, there really weren't enough for all the wonderful projects that wanted to happen. And so I was schlepping around downtown and uptown and looking, and one day I came upon a building that had a for sale sign on it, which was just, you know, I wasn't sure I wasn't like, imagining the for sale sign was on it because it was the most beautiful building. It's the old Union Square Savings Bank, which is actually right now the theater that we're talking about. And at this time, I didn't even know Lucille would know what I'm doing, but she did. Mm -hmm. And she said, I heard you're looking for an opera. And I said, yes, and I just found this beautiful building that's for sale. I don't know, la di da She said, OK, OK, look, you want to be in this business. You want people to follow your lead, get the theater, and name it after yourself. <laughs> did, you, did she have the Lucia Lortel the Lucia theater Lord, time? Yes, which is still on Christopher Street. And yes. And I said, oh my God, that just feels like two. I can't do that. You know, that's just, oh my God. And she said, why can't you do it? I said, because, you know, I just want what's in the theater to represent me. I just, I want to do good work, but I don't think I want my name on the theater. That feels a bit uncomfortable for me. She said, okay. I don't think it's uncomfortable for you. And if you don't do it, and if I didn't do it, why will other women think that they should do it? Why don't you do it as a sign of confidence? Why don't you do it in a way to inspire other people to do it? It's not something you should be ashamed of. And so I thought about that, and then when we were able to close the deal on getting the building, which became the theater, I said, hmm, feel better about this. <laughs> yeah. And so I did name it the Daryl Roth Theater, which sometimes still gives me a little bit of a, you know, an icky feeling, but then I get over it because I really think that it is a good thing to be able to do something and inspire other people to say, well, she did it. Maybe I can do it. That may have been a story specifically about a piece of real estate, but it is also a story about who you are and who you have who you have inspired the theater community to be. Um, I can't tell you how many young people I know who look up to you and and think and actually even not so young people who go like, why shouldn't I do this? And why shouldn't I make something with what I have at my disposal right now? Whether that's uh, you know a couple of sock puppets in a cardboard box, or whether that's a bunch of friends in my college campus, or whether that's you know the a bunch of my colleagues who get together on our lunch break and do a reading of something, or you know, and and I think that you are setting the example of of well, why can't I? Why shouldn't I? And who's stopping me? And like we all need more of that in our lives. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I I hope that I have been inspiring for other people that are. Um, you know, looking for new chapters in life, because that was my new chapter in life. I like to come back to the fact that, you know, life goes on. So instead of thinking about what you wish you could do, why not try to do it? That's my motto. I think that people that are, you know, older, and not that 40, 50 is older, I don't mean that, but sometimes you're, you're faced with an opportunity to try something new. And if you really love it, and if you really feel you can add something to the conversation, I say go for it. I mean, I, people said that I was like the Nike commercial on that day because I did just do it. I had no reason to do it, but I had no reason not to do it. You know, I think that's a better way to think about it. And um, so I encourage young people and more mature people to do whatever. I think one of my favorite ways of looking at the world that I think you embody is that being new at something is not the same as being bad at it. And sometimes they can get confused for each other, but when you go in ready to be new at something, it's inspiring instead of disheartening. I think that's really well said. I think if you bring a new energy to something that, that you really feel 
you know, organically honest. I can bring something new to this table. I can look at something a different way. I don't know, I think that's really exciting. It's kind of lifeblood for all of us. It's like, you know, sometimes I go to see a play or I read a play or I talk to somebody and I feel like I just had a B12 shot, you know, and it feels terrific. It feels terrific. You can get that. You can get that from so many things in life that we just need to be open to. So let's come back to the very present. You have a show that's running right now, The Last Day of yes, the Summer. I Tell do. us about I that. Do. So this is a, a great new musical, a new original musical based on a book by Steve Kluger called The Last Days of Summer. And it does rather incorporate all the things I'm interested in. It has a bit of a Jewish theme. It takes place in the 40s with fabulous <coughs> jazz music and, and Jason Howland wrote the music. Jeff Calhoun's directing it. And it's at the George Street Playhouse in New Brunswick. Um, delighting audiences. It's just been up for about 10 days, not even. And um, I think it's the kind of musical that people are ready for at this moment in time. It's, it's, it talks about immigration in a way that a family is, is sent off. Uh, it, it talks about how baseball, which I'm not even a sports fan to be honest, but this particular story uses baseball as a way to kind of bring people together, which I think sports does. And it's very joyous. And I think that it's kind of what people are looking for these days. There's no angst. It's not very edgy. It's just kind of beautiful. So that's, that's, that's what I'm feeling right now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't know. I think the world needs a little more of it. just feels good. So, so the, the run at George Street, how long is that going to be? It's oh. until November 10th. And then we'll see what the future is. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in licensing it. I don't know if it's meant to move to Broadway. That's another thing I would like to talk about, if you don't mind. Of course. I have a big thing about everybody feeling that if you don't, if you develop something and you, you create something wonderful, but if it doesn't get to Broadway, it's not worthy. I really hate that philosophy. It's my personal thing about being supportive of good work that could find its home all over the world, all over this country, all over the world. And yet, it's, it feels often that if it doesn't get you know, the Broadway uh, cachet, that it, it's not good enough. And that, to me, is very troublesome. Because a lot of things that are created, plays and musicals both, may not find their audience on Broadway. They just may not. That doesn't mean they're not worthy, wonderful, full of entertainment, full of talent. And so I, I don't know where Between the Lines is going to end up after it does its off-Broadway New York run. I don't know where Last Days of Summer will go, but I know they're both really good. And for me, that's the first level of success. And if it's the only level of success, that's good too. I, uh, I also, I think that that's wonderful and beautiful and I wholeheartedly agree. I also love that, that other side of you, that like badass, like, <laughs> you don't know what badass means? It no, is, I, <laughs> I mean it, nobody can take you down. Um, when I, when, when, when Daryl was being introduced, I looked at her and I raised an eyebrow and I said, oh, only seven Pulitzer Prizes. She said, oh, I'm working on the eighth. <laughs> uh, and with that, I think let's, let's take some questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, so having produced that production of Indecent in Vermont. Um, thank wanted, you. Thank you for making that show um, become what it became. But my question um, is actually tied to that, which is I'm wondering if you can talk about how you perceive audiences having changed or not changed um, in relatively recent history. And I ask this because I have, as I start to program in my position a year, I find that I'm looking to the work that you have brought forward for uh, the direction in which I want to lead my audience. Um, so Kinky Boots, for example, is a great example of something that I trust my audience will take a ride with, but also, as you said, get something out of it. So uh, if you have any thoughts about how audiences are evolving, how you might want them to evolve. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. First, thank you for those nice words. I appreciate that, really. Um, I think I have seen audiences evolve in a number of ways. On the 
positive side, I'm really happy to see more families coming to theater together. And not just to the Disney shows, but really to some of the plays that I'm surprised to see families at. I love that. I love that. On the not so positive side, I see a lot of people coming to theater and I think they feel they're in the movies. They're eating popcorn and talking and not focusing. I don't know, I feel when you walk into a theater it's a sacred place. And I really, I get so testy when people are noisy. I've often had to be stopped from being a little rude because it just makes me crazy when people are crunching on the candy and sippy cups are slurring. I get really pissy about that. So I think that the audiences are not as respectful as I would like them to be. Now that could be a little old fashioned. Probably it is. Because I was taught that you have a theater etiquette and that when you come into a theater you sit and you prepare yourself in a way that you might if you're in a synagogue or a church. I mean, that's a little extreme, but I kind of feel that. And so the audience behavior is troublesome to me. <coughs> the bigger overall trouble is that a lot of people cannot afford tickets. And so the answer to that is for us to all figure out ways to underwrite tickets, make tickets more accessible, figure out partnerships with, you know, with philanthropy in mind. And, uh, be able to introduce people to theater and also introduce them to theater etiquette, if I may say. You know, and we've done that with young people that have come to some of the shows for the first time ever. We brought a lot of students in to see Gloria who had never seen theater before, had never been in a theater before. And we had a little very lovely conversation about how it is to listen to the actors and respect the actors and what they're saying and then hold their questions to the end and, you know, don't necessarily talk to your neighbor during the show, but yes, please talk to your neighbor after the show. So, like that. Like that. Maybe we need to do some kind of, like, web series so we can, we'll, we'll talk about that, we'll collaborate on something like that. Always thinking that one. <laughs> Where's our next question? Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could talk for just a second about your partnerships with the nonprofit um, theater companies that you're producing at. You mentioned MTC and George Street and Second Stage. So how do you work together with the nonprofit to make a piece together? That's a really good question. And I have to say, I have been working um, in partnership with nonprofits for a very long time. I mean, we now call it enhancement. Um, and I like that word, sort of. But what it is, is a partnership so that things can get done in a way that may be less strained for the nonprofit. So it goes both ways in terms of how it begins, in my experience. Sometimes I will have a project, a play that I've read that I'm very excited about, and I think that it needs to be developed under the safety net or with the safety net of a nonprofit. So I might present it to a nonprofit theater and say, if you're interested, could you read this play and might it fit into your season? And if it does, I would be very willing to help you um, with the financing of it. And that's a way for me to see the play, for it to be developed, for the playwright to work on it in a safer way, rather than just saying, okay, let's try a commercial run. It may not be ready for that, but it's not fair for me to put especially a new work out into the world before it's time. So that's one way. The other way that often happens is that nonprofits will call me, as well as other producers, and say, do you, uh, we have a play, we're looking to put it in our season, it's gonna cost a little more than we thought or that we have in our budget. Would you read it? Might you be interested? If you like it, can you help us? So it goes back and forth, back and forth. I'm very open to that. A lot of producers are not so thrilled with the idea. I like it because partly, it's, I call it theater philanthropy, in a way. Because some of these projects will get developed and not go anywhere else. That's okay, you know, they had a beginning, they had a birthing, maybe at some point they will continue on, but maybe they won't. So the money is not a guaranteed money. But then I say to myself, well, if you did it commercially and it didn't work, where'd that money go? At least you have something that you can feel you help happen. So I'm, I'm very pro-enhancing and I've done it a lot. And so the way that we can all work together, I think, makes the most sense. Uh, I just realized another through line about you that I think every theater maker in the world can, including audience members, can take away. And that is, 
you are such a good listener. Whether you're listening to your audiences, whether you're listening to your collaborators, or whether you're listening to your own gut, you are tuned in to the messages that you are getting, and you're using the, that feedback to make everything you do bigger, bolder, and more accessible to everyone. So let us all take that away today. Thank you so much, Sarah.